Thank you for joining us tonight. Really appreciate that. And uh, we are continuing our study on what Calvinism is and why we as Hope Baptist Church stand firmly against all five points. And uh, so tonight we are going to be reviewing okay, yeah, the fourth point, which is the eye of tulip. Now, I personally love tulips, but I don't love this tulip. So would you please turn to Matthew chapter 22, verse 12 through 14. We're going to go to a text that Calvinists love, but to me, it actually undermines their whole system. And we're going to review this text, but we'll really more examine it at the end and uh, hopefully build a point that will, will help uh, build a case that will help you. Matthew chapter 22, I better turn there myself, and verse number 12 says, And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was, and he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are very grateful for your goodness to us. And Lord, as we reveal, review and study your word and understanding that you give us a free will, and then therefore we are responsible for everything we do, Lord, I'm convicted that I will be judged for every thought and every action. And so, Lord, I ask that you would strengthen, help, guide, teach, instruct, and that your truth may cause us to be more like Jesus Christ. I do pray if there's any that would hear this lesson that has never trusted you as their Savior, that they would make that decision. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. So the fourth lesson or the fourth letter is I of Tulip. And of course, that speaks of irresistible grace. And it's one of the five central points of Calvinism. And we want to examine that. But the question I have as a simple Bible reader is where in the world does the idea of irresistible grace come from? Because so much of my Bible seems to me to say the opposite. It seems to me that a great majority of my Bible is a holy God rebuking and reproving sinful men. And so they are not only, they are not doing his will, they are resisting his will. And yet there's an idea of the sovereignty of God that says no man can resist his will. Men are not free. And I don't understand that. Because I see a whole record of men against God, men not, go, men not obeying God. And if a Calvinist were listening to this, they would probably say, well, Brother Andrew, you just don't understand Calvinism. Well, I'm going to make a case, and I'm going to quote many Calvinists to simply try to under, help those to understand and help us to understand that, uh, that irresistible grace and the entire Calvinistic system is not only partially biblical, it is unbiblical altogether. Now, I would also say there are many who, who, who call themselves Calvinists that do hold to the gospel. I, I agree there, but I'm going to make the case in a few points that the, the uh, doctrines of Calvinism, the teachings of Calvinism come very, very close to another gospel entirely. And we'll, we'll understand that in just a second. But... I asked a simple question, if God's grace is irresistible, why did God reason with Israel? Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 3, this is one of thousands, this is, this is, but Jeremiah 4, Jeremiah writes, For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, break up your fallow ground, and sow not among thorns, circumcise yourselves to the Lord, and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah. And all and all throughout all the prophets, you see this recurring message, repent, turn from your sin, turn to God. And they resist 
the word of God. They resist the will of God. And they resist the grace of God. My Bible records lots of resistance and because of men's sin nature. But I would ask, if salvation is only the result of an eternal decree of God that can neither be resisted nor altered, why did God take so much of our Bible to reason with men and to persuade them to turn? Why not total just why not just um, irresistibly call them? Uh, why not just elect them to salvation? If he's spending so much of scripture to, to, to reason with men, it is because they have a free will. But why did God not elect them? And I'm not trying to be facetious or, or super clever, but the truth is Israel was elected. Isaiah 45 says, For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel mine elect, I have called thee, which is Cyrus, by name, I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. Genesis 12, the Lord called out Abraham, and the Lord said Abraham, and he made with him an, an un, everlasting, unconditional covenant. And uh, we know that text well. I will make thee a great nation. I will bless thee. I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. I will bless them that bless thee, curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. You see, Israel was selected for a purpose. That purpose was to bring forth the Messiah. The purpose was to make known to the world the Messiah. But even though the nation of Israel was elected, individually, they were responsible to come God's way or to reject his way. So what, my question that we started with, where does the idea of irresistible grace come from? It does not come from scripture. And we're going to show that. But there are three, there are three main way, things that a Calvinist will say to support the idea of irresistible grace, which to, and, and I'm, speaking, I'm speaking subjectively, I'm speaking Andrew's opinion, but to me is nowhere found in scripture. So where do we get this from? There's three arguments you're going to run into. Number one, it is an outgrowth. It is uh, the, the child, the, uh, the successor of the Calvinist idea of total depravity. And so, um, remember, we, we, we asked what, what ability is it needed to receive a gift? Um, that was our title of our total depravity study. But a Calvinist insists that man is so totally depraved, he is unable to respond to God. Not only must he be regenerated before he can believe, but he must be regenerated against his depraved will. So here's the idea. You are an enemy of God before you're saved. You are so against God, so turned away from God that you will never, ever, ever turn to God. And therefore, even though you may want to turn to God, your carnal depraved will must be overpowered for you to actually turn to God because you never would because you're so depraved. Do you, do you see that? So God must come over your will. God must overcome your will. So you will will to be saved because you never would. Can I remind you that um, salvation is a win-win? There is a cross to be born, but I'll be honest. I didn't have to think too long about whether I wanted to be saved because I understood that, uh, so yeah, it does look like somebody's waiting there, because I understood that I was in need of a savior and hell was a long time and I wanted to be saved. But this is a key teaching of Calvinism. So irresistible grace is an outgrowth, is a successor of the Calvinist idea of total depravity. John Piper says, quote, there can be no salvation without the reality of irresistible grace. If we are dead in our sins, totally unable to submit to God, then we will never believe in Christ unless God overcomes our rebellion. He continues, the doctrine of irresistible grace means that God is sovereign and can overcome all resistance when he wills. And so we see that one 
of the reasons why a Calvinist will claim irresistible grace is to maintain their entire theological system. You cannot have unconditional election without irresistible grace. You cannot have total depravity that someone is so depraved in their sin and have a saved person without God overcoming their will. So the basis for, for irresistible grace is not scripture. It is a Calvinist extra biblical system. And I'm gonna show you that. But number two, and you see, I, I mean, I read my Bible and irresistible grace is like the opposite of my whole Bible. Uh, we do have a free will. In fact, my problem is not not being able to resist God. It's grace. My problem is is constantly resisting God's grace. It is possible to resist his grace. But number two, a, the second reason why a Calvinist will maintain to the irresistible grace is the statement that if a man can resist God, then God is not all powerful. You get that? So if you can resist God, well, that, then that means that God can't do anything because that means that your will is conflicting with God's will. And if you can resist and your will is higher than, wait a minute, God is sovereign. God is omnipotent. And my rejection of his will is in no way conflicts with his sovereignty. Rather, it merits judgment because God is not, God not only does, he judges for, thing, for, for disobedience. But I'm going to give, I'm going to quote you a few Calvinists. So this, this is, I mean, I've read this many times, but here's a few of the quotes. Uh, C.D. Cole writes, the power of grace is the power of God. This makes it fitting to speak of irresistible grace. Surely we can speak of an irresistible God. Is God all powerful? Yes, therefore his grace is, is, is irresistible. I'm sorry, that's a leap. That's not in scripture. You're, you're, imagining, you're imagining and you're taking a leap with the principle of God's sovereignty uh, to say that God is decreed and, and God irresistibly forces whatever he does. Um, I'm sorry, omnipotence has nothing to do with how a gift is bestowed. Uh, my daughter's birthday party was yesterday, and I, I gave her a gift. Now, the fact that I could give her um, much more than I gave her, I'm trying not to have too futile of an illustration, but the fact that comparatively to my little baby, I am in a sense, in a, in a very junior sense, omnipotent, I could do it. The fact that I could do that does not mean that I took the cake and I pushed it down her throat. No, 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 I wanted her to receive the present. I, and, and God's power is not threatened by man's resistance. Um, another Calvinist says, I repeat, quote, I repeat, the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. Nothing can stop it. If God's grace can be successfully resisted, then God can be overcome. That's simply not true. God's offer of salvation, and by the way, offer to accept or reject, does not conflict with the sovereignty and omnipotence of our God. This is flawed logic. The power of the gospel, by the way, is not God's power to force it on you. The power of the gospel, last time I checked, was the miracle of how a, 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 a sinner in, in the bondage of sin could be declared righteous before holy God. That's the power of the gospel, not the power of the transmission of the gift. You understand that? So if they're making a leap here, and it's a logical assumption, and it is not based in scripture. First, first objection, number one, is an outgrowth of total depravity. If man cannot respond to God, then grace must be irresistible. They have to have that, by the way. If, if they don't have that irresistible grace, and they maintain to their perverted view of total depravity, then no one could be saved. So this is an essential doctrine for them wrong. Number two, they, they kind of make it so that if man can resist God, then God is not all-powerful. Wrong. God is all-powerful, and he does give us a free will. Number three, 
And this is something that I've noticed. This is not something I read in books, but this is something that I've noticed as I've listened in preparation to some Calvinist uh, preachers. But let me see if I can get this out. By reterming will as an act of will, act of the will, they make personal faith a work. Do you get that? By reterming will as an act of the will, they make personal faith a work. Let me read you a quote from Arthur Pink. Pink writes that if man could be, that if man by an act of his will uh, could believe on Christ, then quote, the Christian would have a ground for boasting and self-glorying over his cooperation with the spirit. So they're saying, okay, if the decision to receive Christ is a personal is a personally made decision, then then you just you're going to go brag about it. And what you're really saying is um, is that work is required. Uh, Pink also writes about a hundred pages later. He says, "Quote to say that the sinner's salvation turns upon the action of his own will." is another form of the God dishonoring dogma of salvation by human effort. Any movement of the will is a work. You see what they're doing? It's, it's a sleight of hands. It's, it's, it's equating will with work. The, the decision to work is not work itself, okay? The will is not work. In fact, the contrast with scripture is never faith versus will, it is faith versus works. And so for them to, it's, it, have you ever been arguing with somebody and they, they throw what we call a straw man argument at you? Have you ever, have you ever had that? Okay. Probably if you've been married for a couple of years, you've thrown a few of those ones yourselves and you probably had a few thrown at you. That's not what I'm saying. Okay. So they're trying to mischaracterize the other side and they're saying, wait a minute, if you believe that you can receive the gospel of God, well, then you have a part of your salvation. And I'll say, I had nothing to do with the merit of my salvation. Christ accomplished anything, everything. It is finished on the cross of Christ. 100%. It's all God and not men. But that does not mean I was not called and responsible to receive the gift. Let me say, and they, the Calvinists, they can say, they can do a hundred times and they can say, well, if you have to receive the gift then you're kind of earning your salvation too. No, the act of the will is not a work. And to, dis, and to confuse the two and to assume that fact is not in scripture. The contrast of scripture, Romans Chapter four. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. It is, it is the contrast of works and of faith. It is not will and of faith. And by the way, Ephesians chapter two, verse eight, for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Grace is the gift there, not faith. But we're going to actually have to push that study off till next week, where we, we uh, will review a few more of the uh, contentious passages on this issue. But can I just offer a warning? When the will of man is bypassed as a requirement for salvation, we are very close to teaching another gospel. Now, there are many, there are many who claim to be Calvinists who, are, who have preached a wonderful gospel message, such as Charles Spurgeon. I'm not saying they all preach another gospel. But I do make this statement, and I stand by it. When the will of man is bypassed as a requirement, we are very close to teaching another gospel. By comparison, not only are we asked to believe, are we able to believe, we are commanded to believe. Personal faith, personal decision to depend on the Lord Jesus Christ is, as Savior is required. And if you rest on the theoretical, I don't know if I am, I don't know if I'm not, election, and you're not resting on the person of Jesus Christ by your personal choice, let me just tell you, you're not saved. Because the faith of a born-again Christian is not an election, it is in the person of Jesus Christ. And I can hear it again, some Calvinists will say, Brother Andrew, you don't understand Calvinism. I'm just saying, you have to make the choice to believe. 
And if you, if man is not required slash unable to believe, that's a big question. And we already understand how it is inherent in the Calvinist system that they put regeneration before faith. Regeneration is part of being in the family of God. So you can be quickened, be in the family of God, and be in Christ before being saved. That's already, we've talked a lot about that. But I'm just saying, you are required to believe the gospel and to say that you are unable to, and, this, and then to say that when you do, it had nothing to do with your will. Better be careful. Because... When you're not required to believe the gospel, last time I checked, I'm not trying to be facetious, the Philippian jailer asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? And he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And you go to the Greek in that, that is in the imperative mood. You must believe. You must believe. And when you withdraw the human will from that, you change faith. And it really, I'm not trying to be angry but it verges on a different gospel and we better be careful. What is irresistible grace? Well, let's look at the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 10, paragraph one and two. I'm gonna read it, it's a little bit long, but here's what it is. All those whom God hath predestined unto life and those only he is pleased in his appointed and accepted time effectually to call by his word and spirit out of that state of sin and death in which they are by nature to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ, enlightening their minds spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God, taking away their heart of stone and giving unto them a heart of fresh renewing their wills and by his almighty power determining that to determining them to that which is good and effectually drawing them to Jesus Christ, yet so as they come most freely being made willing by his grace. Paragraph two, this effectual call is of God's free and special grace alone, not only or not from anything at all foreseen in man who is altogether passive therein until being quickened and renewed by the Holy Spirit, he is therefore enabled to answer this call and to embrace the grace offered and obeyed in it. Now, I have it here with you, but essentially it says that God only effectually calls the elect. The elect are passive in the whole experience, and once, elect, and once called, effectually they are enabled to answer the call of God. So they are, they are in my, from what I can understand, they're pairing the calling of God with that uh, regeneration prior to salvation. So, how does this work? Well, hey, calling, calling is, is in the Bible. Uh, Romans 8, 28, uh, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. We're going to review a bunch of verses. So, I've always wondered, where, what's the biblical basis for this idea of irresistible grace? And they take the biblical truth of his calling, and they turn it into something that it is not. And I'm going to try to show you that in the Bible. So how, how do they get to the point of irresistible grace? To make this intricate system of what they term an effectual or irresistible call, the Calvinists must divide the call of God into two separate calls. So the Calvinists divides the calling of God. And I said, wait a minute, the Bible talks about a calling, but would actually there's two different callings. That's interesting. I'd kind of like to see a proof text and we're gonna evaluate their proof text when we finish. But Calvinists call it a general call and an effectual call. So general call, what is that? That is Mark 16, 15, go you into all the world and preach the gospel. And that is, that general call is why many Calvinists do preach the gospel, and I'm grateful that they do, but they say there is a general call that is to be given to all men. And they have to do that to get around some of the calling verses. But then they imagine into the text, they eisegete into the text what they call the effectual call, 
which is the irresistible call. And they say, oh, wait a minute. There's another calling in scripture that is completely different than the call of, 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 of God, the call of the gospel. It is, it is inward. It is, I'm using the word mystical. And, and here's the word they use. It is secret and it is irresistible. But Calvinists, uh, um, by the way, so they'll, they'll, let me get some of the terminology out there. Because as you study Calvinism, there's all sorts of specific terminology, and then there's different terms for that terminology. So here's a few of the different terms. They all say there's two separate calls. Uh, where was I? Some call it a general call, and some call it a general call and an ineffectual call. R.C. Sproul calls it the inward call and the outward call. Others call it the general call and a special call. Regardless, they say there are two calls. Okay. We as non will say, no, there's not two calls. There's one call for all men. Okay, that's our point. So where do you get the two calls from? Well, as I mentioned, the first call of God is the call of God upon all men to uh, by the gospel. And so I'm just going to ask the question. Yeah. If God is sovereign and he is, his will cannot be broken, then the general call is a breaking of his will. Because if he is calling them, if he's actually effectually calling them, in general. There, there is a conflict. Yeah, there's a conflict. And, 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 and uh, the Calvinists have to invent a dual uh, will of God as well. They have to invent a dual will and a dual call. And yeah. And then um, if, if, his, if his second call is irresistible, and that's actually what saves somebody, then it makes the first call irrelevant. Why do you have a first call if it doesn't do any good? Right. It actually saves you the second call. Well, the first call doesn't have any problems. And I would say, um, what a mockery. So I'm supposed to go and tell the whole world about the gospel. I'm supposed to go and tell them when they cannot believe. Yeah. Um, that's like dangling a glass of water in front of a man who's dying of thirst in the desert. Okay, I'm offering to them insincerely what they cannot receive. Is that what God calls us to do? Yeah. Well, I don't see that in the Bible, but they insist. They insist. Oh, no, no, no. Mark 16, 15 is in there. There is a call to go into all the world and preach the gospel. We're supposed to call. And, and, and so they do agree with the general call, but they say the general call, call is not effectual. And they imagine that the effectual call follows the general call. And the effectual call is irresistible. Can I tell you, that's a tempting thing to believe. Tempting. Because we labor in gospel work all day long, all week long, all year long. And the miracle of a conversion, can I tell you, I can, I can witness to it hundred people and I not see a conversion. And then when I do see somebody saved, you know what I want to ask? What made this one get saved and the other 99 not trust Christ? I have that sincere question. I've talked with many people. Why did I trust Christ and my brother didn't? Why did I trust Christ and my dad didn't or my mom didn't? Oh, I know. It must be because God regenerated me. And God irresistibly called me, and I just followed it wrong. God called you, but can I tell you, God didn't just call you. If you're saved tonight, God didn't just call you. And you didn't respond to God just because God specially called you. No, no, no. We read that God is calling all men to himself. Jesus said, no man can come unto me except the Father draw him. But he also said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto myself. Christ is calling all men. Christ is drawing all men. When you were saved, you were called, but you weren't the only one that were called. Calvinism eisegetes into scripture a calling unto salvation that simply is not there. But let's understand. Um, so, a Calvinist will use the biblical truth of the called, calling of God, to springboard into their doctrine of irresistible grace. 
So let's look at some of those verses. So now, would you please turn to um, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, 29, and 30. And we know that all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. So we're called. Can I tell you, if you're a Christian today, that means God called you. It means, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him. And the reason I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior is because he found me. He was looking for me, and he found me, and he called me with the invitation of eternal life and forgiveness of sins. And I accepted. I'm called. It's how it happened. He gave me the gospel. He sent my mom. And he gave her the gospel. And then he gave me the gospel. That's, that's how I was saved. And so, yes, I was called. But one thing that does not say is I was irresistibly called. And what they will read into that verse is that, oh, no, no, no. The calling of Romans 8.30, that's a special calling. That's a special calling. It's not what it says. It just says he called. That's all it says. It says he called. And by the way, verse 29 says, for whom he did foreknow. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. We're looking at the call, please turn to Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. One of their proof texts. Yeah. Just the word predestinate, right? Mm -hmm. Does that not play into the countless hands? That's a great word. That's a great question. So the word predestinate is only found in two passages in the whole Bible, Romans chapter 8, Ephesians chapter 1. We're really going to, we're going to look at some of the problem texts next week, or I would say not say problem text. There's no text that's a problem. Let me rephrase that. We're going to look at some of the contentious texts, but look at what it says in Romans 8. Look right there. Is it predestination unto salvation or is it predestination to be conformed to the image of his son. Yeah, what is, let me. For whom he did for no, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. So here's the thing. If you take out foreknowledge and then you toss out the word after predestinate, you might get Calvinism but you got to take it all. So it's based on foreknowledge and it's predestination to be conformed to the image of his son. It is, listen, I struggled with Calvinism, but when I saw this point that yes, predestinate is in there because God is outside of time and God is sovereign, but God predestinates those whom he foreknows to be like Christ. It, it's right there. And whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Second, uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Who called you? God did. He invited me. He warned me. He convicted me. But what it does not say is that he forced me. He called. He welcomed. He invited. He constrained by his love. Uh, he, he scared me. As, uh, pulling some out of the, out of the uh, as, as the verse go in Jude, uh, with, with pulling some out of the fire. Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ 
This verse reveals, 2 Thessalonians 2.14 reveals, the call to salvation is the general call. It is not a mysterious call. Okay? Whereunto he called you by our gospel, the gospel proclaimed to the obtaining of the glory of, the Lord, our, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at another text. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. First Corinthians chapter one, verse 22 through 24. The Jews require a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. Second Corinthians, uh, first Corinthians, sorry. Did I say second Corinthians? First Corinthians chapter one, verse 23. But we preach Christ crucified under the Jews, a stumbling block under the Greeks, foolishness unto them, which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Now, were those who were called, called with a special inner call? Or does the called refer to those who heard the call and responded to the call? That is a simple descriptive term. Only those who respond to the call are termed the called. It does not teach that they received a separate, mysterious, and irresistible call. You have to read into the text that. You have to read that in. It's not there. They responded to the call. Therefore, they are called the called. Acts chapter 17, verse 30. Can you please turn to Titus chapter 2, verse 11? This is one of the reasons, in addition to the Great Commission, Mark 16, 15, Matthew 28, uh, John 20. In addition to those texts of, 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 the, of the global call that's commanded, um, Titus chapter 2, verse 11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. That grace of the call, all men. I'm just trying to demonstrate, I see calling in the Bible. I see it as a wonderful thing. And hey, when we, when we overreact to Calvinism and we say, hey, God didn't choose me, I, choose, I chose him. Hey, that's going too far the other way. God was looking for me. He, he was, but by the way, he was also looking for the person next to me. And he's, and he's looking for my great, for my uncle who's still unsaved. He's looking for them. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. If you're lost, God's looking for you. Is that, is that a fair thing to say? Because that's what I read. How does called chosen work? Well, the, the key retreat bastion text of, of the idea of irresistible grace is Matthew 20 and Matthew 22. Let's turn there, please. Matthew 20, verse 16. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 16. So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. Turn over to Matthew 22 and verse 14. <clears throat> For many are called, but few are chosen. I'll be honest. I told you, I've told all of you, I, 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 I faced a point. I had a seminary student who was trying to make me become a Calvinist, and I wrestled with it for a little while. But when I came to this verse, this is Andrew straight in the Bible, not reading commentaries, not reading. This is me in the Bible. I had a question. My question was very basic. How can you be called and not chosen? If the call of God is irresistible, if the call of God is effectual, how can you be called but not chosen? But then I discovered the Calvinists believe in two calls. That's how they get around it. They believe in two calls. I don't see two calls in the Bible. I see one call in the Bible, but they believe in two calls. 
And they believe that this is the uh, effectual, the, the, the first call is the general call, and the second call is the effectual call. And I thought I had some quotes written down here that was, would demonstrate Calvin is saying this, but I don't. So is this a proof text for the double call, the split call? Let's look a little closer. Many are called, but few are chosen. These two verses come as the, as the summary and as the finish, the ending of two of Christ's parables, two of Christ's kingdom parables. And let me just say in introduction, uh, the last time I checked, we do not develop major biblical doctrines from parables. If you take any Bible doctrines class, if you take any hermeneutics class, the study of exegeting the text, you will learn day one, maybe day two, that parables are now, this is a Sunday school summary of it, because I remember my son is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It is an illustration, which means a parable has one interpretation and one application. God has a reason for giving the parable, okay? Because there's an, a, an intended purpose for the imaginary story that is God-breathed, what we cannot do with a parable is take details of the parable and build theological systems off of the parable, okay? We can't do that. In fact, you cannot build a major biblical doctrine off of a parable, okay? You got to be careful with that. Do parables communicate biblical truth? Absolutely. But let's look at the whole parable. Matthew chapter 20. We don't really have time to read the whole parable, but... Can I point out that the parable is a landlord speaking to laborers in his vineyard? That's the parable. So many are called, few are chosen. Uh, and and to, 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 to bring those together, you are applying election to labor. Now, if you're like me, that's not a problem. Because from day one, I've been saying God's election has many different applications, many different programs. Jeremiah, before I was in the, while I was yet in the womb, the Lord chose me and ordained thee, a prophet to the nations. There is an election to service. But if you're a Calvinist and you put the election of salvation, the election to salvation, if you attach that to Matthew chapter 20 and verse 16, many are called, but if you are chosen, you have a problem. Because the parable is about workers. The parable is about laboring. So are you telling me that those who are chosen, they labor? They, they labor for their salvation? Because I kind of think if you take one, you got to take the other. It's, you got to take the whole parable. You can't just take it away from the parable. So, so um, uh, last time I checked, uh, Romans chapter 4, I already quoted it, but to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace of debt, Romans 3.28, and we know that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. There is no work required. That's the basis of salvation, right? And yet, if you take this parable, many are called, but few are chosen, and you take it in the context of the parable, which is the Lord uh, calling laborers then you, you got to do something real creative to say that working has nothing to do with my salvation. Now, I say that doesn't apply to salvation. I say this election uh, requires, applies to service. And hey, guess what? If you're called, you're, you're, if, if you're saved, you're called. And you're not, you're, you weren't just invited to, this, to salvation. You are called to serve. So there's, a, there's an election to service. But now let's look at Matthew chapter 22. Verse 14, many are called, but few are chosen. Now I read this, the, 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 the parable here is the parable of the wedding feast. The, the master calls, um, for, sends his servants to invite specific guests. And the specific guests say, I'm busy, I can't come. And then the master is, is furious, 
And he says, destroy those murderers. And he burns them up with fire. So he judges those. But then he goes into the highways and the byways. So we understand. Can I ask you, were those who actually attended Irresistibly Called or given a special invitation? In Matthew chapter 22, I think we all know the parables. So they go into highways and byways, call anybody and everybody, and they come. Did, um, were, were those who actually attended the wedding feast given a special call? Answer is no, they weren't. In fact, it was the opposite of the special call. They were getting the ordinary call. Hey, we were calling special people, but uh, that didn't work. So now we're calling everybody and anybody. It's interesting to me, it actually teaches the opposite of Calvinism. But anyways, um, it does, I, I, am, I, am, I am intrigued that those who were originally chosen are rejected and anybody who wants to come can come. Why did Jesus give this parable? Who is he speaking to? You are reading Matthew chapter 22. Now, let me ask you, who is the intended audience? This is universally agreed. Who is the intended audience for the book of Matthew? This is, this is um, Bible, Bible trivia, uh, Jews. Um, so Jesus is the king of Judah. Matthew's genealogy goes back to David and Abraham. Luke's genealogy goes back to Adam. Luke proves he's a man. Matthew proves he's a Jew. It's written to Jews. When you read the book of Matthew and over and over, you're going to read this thing, that it might be fulfilled as it was written. Why? To convince the Jew that Jesus is the fulfilled Messiah. So Jesus gives this parable and he says, those who were bidden, they rejected it. Do you see how the meaning, when I put that in context, and they said no. And so God says, you are judged. Now I call all men. So those who were originally called, those who were originally chosen were rejected and many were called. You see how you can't just rip that verse away from the parable? It has great meaning. It has rich meaning. The Calvinist uses many other verses. I don't have time to go through all of them, but a Calvinist will read Acts chapter 16, verse 14. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, and she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. Calvinist says, quote, Without that opening of the heart, Lydia could not have believed this is irresistible grace. Second quote, Paul the preacher spoke to Lydia's ear the outward call, but, he, but the Lord spoke to Lydia's heart the inward call of his irresistible grace. That's classic Calvinism right there. The Lord opened her heart. Did the Lord open her heart? Yes, but she still responded. And can I tell you another man? whose heart was opened, Agrippa. Paul speaking to Agrippa, preaching the gospel to him, Acts 26. And he said, King Agrippa, Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Agrippa said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Agrippa was this close. Lydia was this close. But she still had to trust. Can I ask you, have you ever been sharing the gospel with somebody and and, and then the Lord just intervenes and you can tell the Lord's present and you can tell that <clears throat> they understand the working of the gospel. You can tell that they're convicted of sin. Have you ever been there? I hope you have. I, I'm not, I don't get that every time I witness, but there are some times where the Lord is very present. And then have you ever been witnessing to them and they turn away and they never come back? What, what happened? Well, let me tell you this. It wasn't because God didn't call them. It was because they rejected the call he gave them. And when you're soul winning, don't think that when they turned the, away from the gospel, it was because God never called them. No, God was calling them. God was using you as their messenger to persuade them. God was using you as his ambassador with a ministry of reconciliation, but it was not that God did not call them. I don't have time. We're almost out of time, but I have a whole nother section that is all it, all it does is demonstrate 
that God's will can be resisted and grace can be resisted. And God's sovereignty does not require that he institute an irresistible grace. Rather, God sovereignly makes available grace to all men and invites us to receive the grace. Grace is a gift. I would challenge you to look up the word grace and look up a form of the word given gift. And what you're going to find is that grace is almost always given. It's a gift. Now, this is Andrew Canavan and Esword, but you're going to find that grace is either given, it is a gift, or it is received, especially in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, you'll find that grace is find, find or found. But in the New Testament, you're, always going to, you're almost always going to find that grace is given, or it is a gift, or it is received. Does that sound irresistible to you? Not to me. I'm sorry. No, I'm not reading the Calvinists. I'm not reading the non-Calvinists. I'm just reading the Bible. And grace is given. Grace is free. It is not forced. But the Old Testament prophets pleaded with Israel, and they would not. I have so many verses I could read. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 24 and verse 25 says, Because I have called, and ye refused. refused. I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. We... Not only do we resist God's will, not, not only can God's will be resisted, Paul, by the way, asks a rhetorical question in Romans chapter 9, who hath resisted his will? I got news for you. Every person in the world has resisted his will, but they will be judged for that, and God will overcome them, not overcome their will. He will overcome their either unbelief with judgment or he will receive their belief with, with mercy. Genesis chapter 6. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for also that he is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. And I, I, Jeremiah chapter 11 says, For I earnestly protested unto your fathers in that day that I brought them up out of the land of Egypt, even unto this day, rising early and protesting, saying, Obey my voice. Isaiah 5 and now, o inhabitant of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard, what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have done unto it? And God says, I have called, I have called day and night. I have protested, I have pleaded with you. Hosea marries Gomer. Joel speaks of the day of the Lord. Om Amos the shepherd speak. Ezekiel the priest in exile speaks. Daniel, Elijah, and Elisha preach. And I'm just saying we have a, a wide array of, of messengers that are, are begging Israel, repent, turn from your sin. And Israel's failure to do so simply, simply demonstrates God's grace can be rejected. And it's rejected by all who are unsaved. Would you turn to Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 1? Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 1. He that being often reproved hardeth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed in that without remedy. I believe that's the story of every lost man. They're without excuse. They must hear the gospel. He that being often reproved, hard his neck. I believe, uh, the, Jesus said in John 16, when, when the spirit has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. I believe that God is reasoning. God is convicting. God is using their conscience. He's using the revelation of his deity. He's using his word and he's reproving them. But there is, comes a point when it's too late. But can I tell you, if you're living, it's never too late. If you're living, you could be the called if you'll receive the call. Can God's will resist it? Uh, Israel proves a thousand times over God's will can be resisted. Grace can be resisted. Irresistible grace is not taught in Scripture. But here's my question. And one thing I've always wondered is... 
Um, if Calvinism is true, and I know they have an answer for this, I'm not answering, I'm not asking a question that they don't understand, but if Calvinism is true and God from eternity past declares all that shall be, and the depravity of man bends away from that, then when the depravity, when, when I'm alive unto God, if God doesn't give us a free will, then why do Christians sin? If God does not give men a free will, why do Christians sin? Likewise, reckon yourselves to be dead unto sin and alive indeed unto God. Romans chapter 6. Does God will for you to be holy? 1 Peter 1.15 but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. When you're not holy, are you resisting his will? Absolutely. First John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. First Thessalonians 5.18. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So the will of God is that you never, ever complain one time. So when you complain, are you resisting the will of God? Now I'm preaching to us, and the answer is yes, because God's will can be resisted, and his grace can be resisted. So I want to close with this. I only highlight the truth that Christians can quench the spirit, 1 Thessalonians 5.19, and resist his will, because most Calvinists agree that we must cooperate, yield to, and obey God to be a fruitful Christian life. Many Calvinists write very well against the abundant Christian life movement. The Keswick revivals, the, the, the holiness movement, many, many, many Calvinists write well against that, and they understand that the faith of sanctification is not a, only a resting faith, it is an active, obedient faith. Show me thy faith without thy works, I'll show you my faith by my works. So a Calvinist says, I understand that man must cooperate with God to have a Christian life, hey, to have a holy life. Hey, if, if, you want, if you want to be holy, you have to obey God. You, you, don't, you don't just, you know, pray in your closet for 28 hours a day. You have to obey God. So you're, you must cooperate with God to have a Christian life. And yet those same people adamantly refuse, adamantly refuse that man can do anything, that he can lift a finger to respond to God. And here's what I'm going to say. The Calvinist goes way off. When he denies the free will of man before salvation, you are responsible to believe. But let me also say, there's another form of Christian, Christianity called the charismatic movement. And they go beyond the cross and they say, oh, no, now that you're saved, there's, there's no good in your flesh. You must cease to exist and you must, here's the quote, let go and let God. Don't exercise your will. Let God do it all. Let God do it all. Let God do it all. And that's the beginning of the higher life movement. And I'm just saying, do you see how on both sides, there's an effort to remove personal responsibility? Do you see on both sides? The Calvinist says, no man cannot believe to the cross. The charismatic says, man really can only believe and he can't obey or do anything beyond the cross. No, no, no. It is both. I'm not saying it's not faith alone. No, it is absolutely faith alone. But the will of man to repent and believe the gospel, and then the will of man to obey the gospel and yield to the spirit is required. And you, when you remove that and you say, oh, no, God's grace is irresistible because I'm so depraved and I would never respond to God because I just never would. And he must overpower my will wrong. You must submit your will. You must repent at the foot of the cross. And if you're resting in the idea that you're one of the elect and you have not personally trusted in Jesus Christ, admitted that you're a sinner and, and, and fallen holy on the blood of Jesus Christ, then you're not saved. So let us be men that understand that God gives to all men a free will, all men. And there's coming a day when we will be judged. Don't let anybody tell you that you're not responsible to believe the gospel. Don't let anybody tell you that Christ is so powerful in your life. 
that you don't have to do anything. Just let go and let God. You, without me, you can do nothing. God must do it all, but you must labor with God in the area of sanctification, not salvation, sanctification. But you must turn to God for salvation. Pastor Dan.